Good afternoon, sir. Can you see and hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr Parsons, we're going to move on to a few separate topics, the first of which is Second Sight. Could we start, please, at WBON 40767? So we'll start on the 12th of July 2013. If we scroll down, there is an email from you to Susan Crichton. And you say as follows, Susan, had a quick chat with Gavin. Who, who was Gavin? Is that Gavin Matthews? Correct. And what was his position? Uh, he was my supervising partner. Yes. Arbitration will probably end up as formal and long-winded uh, as court proceedings. We'd also lose a degree of control. The process and timing would be controlled by the arbitrator. I'm not attracted to this. Um, so they're discussing options. One is arbitration, another is mediation. And you come on now to address mediation. And you say, mediation is a definite possibility. I could envisage a mediation between the post office and each sub-postmaster, uh, with also second sight in the room, uh, and perhaps shoesmiths. This gives each sub-postmaster the opportunity to voice their views and discuss second sight's findings. Having a mediator in the room would help equalise the imbalance of power. Mediation would not commit the post office to any outcome unless one was agreed by both parties and could be counted, uh, conducted on our timetable. If the mediations were run after Second Sight's final report, this may help ensure that the report focuses on general themes whilst leaving specific cases to be heard in the subsequent mediation process. Uh, the risk in that me is that mediation is usually set up with a view to reaching a resolution. As discussed yesterday, I doubt we will ever reach closure on these cases. The post office's comms team would therefore need a robust media strategy to explain why the mediations will, in the majority of cases, fail to reach a consensus between the post office and the sub-postmaster. Otherwise, this will be spun as a failure to close out this matter. Um, it seems as though there was a discussion the previous day, then, about mediation. Do you recall that, those discussions? Uh, I recall that during this period there were a, a number of discussions about different ways of uh, taking things forward after the second site interim report, of which mediation was one of the possibilities. Now, why would mediations in the majority of cases fail to reach a consensus? My understanding at this point in time is that there was a large delta between post office's view of the world and the sub-postmaster's view of the world. Um, we know that it did go to mediation ultimately. Um, what was the purpose of mediation if there was this large gulf that was unlikely to result in any resolution? So the shape of this moved on after this email into a slightly different shape of scheme where the cases would be reinvestigated first and then mediated, which I thought would close the gap between the, the two parties and give mediation more of a prospect of success. Could we please turn to poll 00191954? Shortly, uh, same day in fact, 12th of July. If we turn to page four, we can see there that Alan Bates has been in touch uh, addressing matters uh, that have been discussed. And it comes to a point in where you are advising, if we turn to page one, please. He made some suggestions on how the mediation scheme might be conducted. And then we have your advice to Susan Crichton here. You say, Alan's approach seems similar to what we discussed yesterday. However, there are some critical differences. Second Sight seemed to be being used as a weapon by the Justice for Sub-Postmasters Alliance to force post office into settlement. That is not their job. The approach assumes that the post office is liable and will offer settlements and seems to hint at cash settlements. I'm not sure where Second Sight have got this idea from. Any hint that the post office may be considering cash settlements would encourage the toxic cases, encourage shoesmiths and play badly in the media. I think we need to put a stop to this quickly. Let's just unpack that paragraph, please. 
First of all, cash settlements. It seems as though you're surprised by the suggestion of cash settlements in the summer of 2013. Why is that? Uh, I think if... Um, I can't see Alan's email here, um, but I think the scheme that he was envisaging was more of a compensation scheme, whereby there was a sort of almost a presumption of liability, and it was just then about um, compensating people. Whilst at this stage, post office wasn't in, a, in their instructions weren't that they weren't prepared to accept liability uh, across across a white piece. What is the purpose of mediation if? there isn't going to be a financial settlement at the end of it? There, there could possibly be a financial settlement at the end of mediation. But as I say, I, I think Alan's proposal, which is further down this email chain, wasn't a, a mediation proposal. It sort of assumed more of a compensation scheme structure. Um, any hint that the post office may be considering cash settlements would encourage the toxic cases. Just pausing there, that's an expression we've seen elsewhere. Can you assist us with what toxic cases were? I think that was Alan's choice of words to describe what he saw as particularly difficult sub-postmaster cases. Um, so it would, they would be encouraged by the idea of cash settlements, encourage shoesmiths and play badly in the media. I think we need to put a stop to this quickly. I mean, just reading that, what would be the... I mean, mediation would at some stage presumably lead to some cash payments to sub-postmasters, wouldn't it? Yes, but as I said, I think Alan's email below isn't really talking about a mediation-type structure. It's talking more about a compensation scheme structure that assumes liability. So they're two very different concepts... And I was concerned here with post office conceding the liability point and assuming there would be cash settlements in every case. Um, we're going to move on to December 2013. Can we please turn to poll 00327110? An email to you, uh, from you to Martin Smith, Jarnell Singh and Roderick Williams. Martin, Jarnell, Roderick, um, as discussed last week below is our next thorny question on the interaction between the mediation scheme and criminal prosecutions. Uh, we now have four cases in the scheme subject to live criminal investigations slash prosecutions. Thus far, we've refused to provide any details of these cases to the working group. However, the working group are concerned that as they have no oversight on these cases, there's no way of, uh, for them to validate that and um, that the applicant's application to the scheme should remain suspended. Underlying this is a general and, in my view, unwarranted distrust by Second Sight and the Justice for Sub-Postmasters Alliance of how the post office handles criminal cases. Um, We've spoken a lot today about how, um, in your view, you had a very hands-off approach to the criminal cases. H how is it that you formed the view that their distrust was unwarranted? I can't recall this particular email or what drove that thought. Presumably you had a sufficient knowledge of how the criminal cases were being addressed to write in an email that it was an unwarranted distrust. All my knowledge about the criminal cases was passed to me by the criminal lawyers. I never reviewed any of the criminal cases myself. But you didn't say, in Cartwright King's view, it's unwarranted. You had formed a view by this stage about the trust that should be placed in the post office's handling of criminal cases. How did you form that view? Based on the information I'd seen from the criminal lawyers. And did you just assume that what they had told you was correct in that respect? Yes, because I was reliant on them to provide me with that information. Could we please turn to poll 00201761? We're now in March 2014, 13th of March. And this is an email from yourself to Roderick <coughs> Williams. If we actually scroll down slightly at the bottom, you can see there he <coughs> is asking you 
He says, what are your thoughts on how we should feed uh, to Second Sight's Fujitsu response below on Second Sight's MO14 report? So that's a specific review that Second Sight are conducting. If we scroll up, please, you say as follows. Uh, Roderick, I think we hold fire until we see the thematic report. So by this stage, Second Sight, we're working on a second report that addressed themes. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. At the working group meeting on <coughs> Friday, Second Sight hinted that their concern is not a comms failure between branch and data center, and therefore a failure to record transactions to the audit log in the DC, but rather it was where a third-party system received the transactions, uh, but there is a comms failure that stops the transaction completing at the branch end. Uh, they call this the one-sided transaction issue. The point is not expressly drawn out in M014, but does come out more clearly in M001 Castleton. You then say this, the variation on the comms theme is not directly covered in the Fujitsu data integrity documents, so we may need to commission further work from Fujitsu once we know for certain how Second Sight have characterised this in their thematic report. On that basis, I think sending more information at Second Sight at this stage risks them asking more questions. My preference is for a targeted attack on the Second Sight report when we understand the specifics of their position rather than be on the back foot in trying to defend the entire Horizon comms infrastructure. Second Sight were a firm of independent investigators that had been instructed by the post office to carry out that independent investigation. Uh, is the approach that you're taking here uh, very similar to the approach in litigation? A targeted attack on their report. It does seem rather adversarial, doesn't it? Uh, yes, I, I accept it that I adopted a reasonably adversarial approach. And was that based on instructions, or was that the way that you saw it should be approached? Uh, it was a combination of my doubts at this point in the quality of Second Sight's work, and that was the general direction and theme that post office were taking. And who was setting that direction and theme in your view? Uh, the group of individuals I was talking to on a daily basis about the scheme, so Roderick Williams, Belinda Crow, and the other members of the Project Sparrow team. When the scheme was set up, did anybody ever tell you, for example, this is intended to be like a Truth and Reconciliation Commission or something along those lines where we're not to take an adversarial approach? I don't recall any, I don't recall anything along those lines. Could we please turn to poll 00305714? We're moving now swiftly to the summer of 2014, 11th of August, and there is a meeting. Second Sight's draft part two mediation briefing report. It's a teleconference. Uh, amongst the participants, you're listed there as the representative from Bond Dickinson. Do you recall that meeting? No, I don't. Let's have a look at the notes, the record of that teleconference. Um, could we go, perhaps let's look at page three, please, the bottom half of page three. Thank you. Lack of evidence. Um, Second Sight expressed concern that the character of the conversation is one of litigants, antagonistic. And that's a fair reflection of the approach that you've just described, isn't it? I think it, 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 it waxed and waned. So there was certainly a period of time at the beginning where we were very much looking to cooperate with Second Sight, provide as much information as we could, particularly in the individual cases. At times it became more adversarial, and then at times we tried to row that back again because we realised it had got too adversarial. So I think it moved during the course of, what, the 18 months that the scheme was running. Um, Second Sight claimed this is the antithesis of what the CEO and chair assured them would be the case. Were you aware of any discussions or instructions from the CEO and chair about how the scheme should be conducted? 
don't recall. Post Office reassured Second Sight that the conversation is not antagonistic. Post Office expressed concern about Second Sight not getting to the truth of the case and not providing evidence. Post Office stated, uh, not trying to fetter Second Sight independence or take things out, just want to get the paper right. Post Office expressed concern that the lack of evidence doesn't take things further. Post Office concerned applicants may feel issues are more widespread than they are. Uh, Second Sight claimed they report the truth with an objective to help the applicants. <coughs> scroll over. Post Office raised two examples of items that are out of scope, contractual and criminal. If you look at criminal matters, uh, need to ask why and who are you doing this for. Just looking back at the attendees, there was nobody from Cartwright King at this meeting. You were the only um, external legal advisor at the meeting. Were these likely to have been your words or a summary of, of your words? I don't recall this call. And I think this document was only sent to me a few days ago, so I haven't had a chance to look into it. Post Office flagged the risk of straying into legal, layer upon layer of legal argument, dangerous ground to comment on contract, applicants may rely on as legal advice. Post Office suggested if there are areas second sight are not qualified to investigate, that might be an issue for Post Office to look at. Had the scope been criminal or contract, wouldn't have employed accountants. Second sight concern late in the day to mention out of scope, don't recall anyone raising this previously. No one previously cried foul. The post office responded uh, that this is not about crying foul. Raising now as out of scope has first raised as a material point. You may not recall this exact meeting at which you were attending, um, but can you recall in the summer of 2014 uh, those kinds of real tensions between the post office and second side? Those issues around scope were points of tension. Um, Post Office thought that Second Sight were exceeding their scope by including commentary on legal issues within their reports, where Post Office had attempted to run the scheme without advancing um, legal defences, certainly during the investigation phase. Um, but alongside this, there was also a lot of uh, cooperation in terms of providing information to Second Sight. If we scroll up, it's not just scope, there's the section on lack of evidence. Uh, and it said there, penultimate paragraph, um, post office expressed concern that the lack of evidence doesn't take things further. Post office concerned applicants may feel issues are more widespread than they are. Is that a concern that you recall at that time? a concern at the post office that Second Sight might be giving the impression that things are more widespread than the post office thought them to be? I don't recall the last bullet point being discussed with me. You were at this meeting, though? As I say, I don't recall the meeting. Do you remember that being a concern? I don't recall that, that idea coming up. Could we please turn to poll 3075810? Moving now to the 16th of October, 2014. There's an email, the second email on that page, please, if we scroll down. An email from yourself to Anthony Hooper, so the chair of the working group. And you say, on our last working group call, you asked post office to make clear which cases it considers are suitable for mediation before the face-to-face -face meeting tomorrow. You asked Belinda to ensure that this information was copied to Second Sight, so I have copied in uh, Ron and Ian. Having carefully considered Second Sight's final CRRs, that's the questionnaires. Is that the questionnaires, CRRs? I no, that's the Second Sight report. The reports. Uh, Post Office's position on mediating <coughs> is below. We will explain at the meeting tomorrow our reasons for taking these positions. So you've been asked um, to identify which cases you consider are suitable for mediation, uh, and you have responded to the chair of the working group, and we have there set out the post office's position on mediation. Could we please look at that? So if we scroll down slightly, number one, unsuitable. Number three, unsuitable. Number five, currently minded to consider unsuitable. 
17 unsuitable, 21 unsuitable, 29 unsuitable, etc., etc., etc. At that point, all of the cases were listed by yourself as being unsuitable for mediation. Do you recall that? I'm trying to think if there was any commonality in those cases that led to that decision because this is towards the end of 2014. The cases which were suitable tended to move through the scheme quicker, so they may well have already passed through, and what was left were the ones which were more heavily contested, where post office thought they were unsuitable. So the fact that that list is nearly all unsuitable may be a product of where we are in the scheme at that point in time. If we scroll up slightly, on our last working group call, you asked the post office to make clear which cases it considers are suitable for mediation mm -hmm. before the face-to-face -face meeting. So you've been asked which are suitable, and your response is, in effect, all of them are unsuitable. Well, I suspect at this point in time, these were the cases that were pending decision on whether to go to mediation. So by the end of... This is, can you scroll up ever so slightly so I can see the date? So October 14, at, at this point the cases would have all been at different stages. Some would have still been waiting in investigation, some would have been investigated by post office, some would have been investigated by second site, and some would have probably already gone through to mediation. So I think that's just a snapshot in time of those cases. Do you think that in reality, by that stage of 2014, this was a properly functioning scheme? I think it began to break, break down, well, the working group began to break down around this time and towards the end of 2014. Because the working group was meant to determine which ones were suitable, and at least on the face of this email, it's not actually receiving any that the post office considered to be suitable. But as I say, this is a snapshot. There are, how many cases are there? About 10? There are 150 cases in the scheme. Could we please turn to poll 00141727, please? Still in October, 31st of October now. An email from you to Patrick Bork. Patrick, in recent CRRs, I've noticed Second Sight using language such as the post office has failed to disprove the applicant's assertion. See para 4.2 attached for an example. This is building in a presumption that the applicant is correct and that the post office has to disprove the position even where the applicant has put forward no corroborating evidence. This will lead to the post office losing a lot of battles I think this may be a point to raise with Second Sight on our next call, as it's not within their gift to apply an evidential presumption in favour of the applicants. If anything, the presumption should go in the post office's favour, given that we are notionally the defendant, and two, no one has yet proved a flaw in Horizon. Again, real tensions in that period between the post office and Second Sight, it seems. Uh, yeah, that there were tensions during this, this period. I would just note that the way Second Sight were asked to produce their reports by the working group is they were required to give an opinion where there was evidence and then identify issues on which they, they didn't believe there was sufficient evidence to offer an opinion. So the concern here is they weren't using the structure that was set by the working group. They weren't, sorry? Using the structure for their reports that was set by the working group. Um, I think Sir Anthony Hooper's evidence of this inquiry was he, he wasn't particularly concerned by uh, the paperwork coming from Second Sight at this stage. Would you take a different view? I didn't see Sir Anthony Hooper's evidence. So I apologise, I'm not quite sure what the context was for his comment. Um, is your evidence that you personally had concerns about Second Sight's paperwork as at October 2014? I had concerns at that point about the quality of the work product they were producing. Um, could we please turn to poll 00176599? 7th of November 2014. This is an email that the inquiry seen before. <coughs> Martin Smith to yourself and others. 
And he says, from a criminal perspective, we would advise as a general rule against the disclosure of any documents from a criminal file uh, which had not previously been disclosed to the defendant during the course of the original proceedings. To do otherwise may well enable the defendant or second sight to attempt to criticise the way in which the prosecution was conducted or how the prosecution policy was applied. Clearly, such arguments in a public arena would be uncomfortable for the post office. Um, did that raise any concerns for you? My recollection is that we, WBD on the WBD side, looking from the scheme perspective, were keen to use the material in those files because we thought it helped explain the cases and Martin and Carl Wright King were pushing back against it. I think ultimately that question was taken up to the working group and so Anthony <coughs> gave some directions on how to proceed. Could we please now look at poll 00214323, 9th of December 2014. Second Sight have provided a list of questions that they are seeking answers to. Um, you can see there there's attachment Second Sight questions for the post office. And this is an email from yourself to Belinda Crow and others. And you say as follows, there are some sensible questions in here but there is also a massive fishing expedition for information that does not address issues raised by applicants. I've highlighted all the questions that I think are just fishing for info in blue. Uh, there are also a number of questions that are outside the scope of the scheme. Most telling is the fact that there are only a handful of questions about Horizon. Nearly all the questions are about accounting practices. I think you've accepted already that Second Sight were um, the approach that the post office was taking was adversarial in nature. Um, is this an example of that? Because, of course, Second Sight had been appointed as independent investigators. They've made a request to the post office for information. And you, a lawyer on post office's behalf, have gone through that and reached the view that it's a what you might call a fishing expedition in litigation, uh, and uh, are addressing there which ones should and shouldn't be answered. So as I said earlier, the, the adversarial nature of it waxed and waned over time. Um, here I'm expressing concern about some of the questions, but my understanding is actually that a, a good number of those questions, I, I can't remember the exact amounts, were, were actually answered. We can have a look. I can take you, if you'd like to, um, well, I may be able to take you to that document perhaps tomorrow morning. Um, but is your approach here particularly adversarial, given that in Second Sight had been appointed as independent investigators? No, I don't think so. I'm just ad advising post office on what I think is the relevance of the questions. And then if you look at the last part there it says my guess this this is going to take quite a lot of work to answer all these questions and, and i recall that it was quite a lot of work but a lot of the questions were answered well let's have a look at that can we look at poll 00021863 please same month december 2014 i think we're on the 29th of december now if we turn to page three please Linda Crow emails. She says, Mark Poole slash Andy Parsons, would you be able to prepare the schedule of questions to which the post office is not prepared to respond and the reasons why? Now, it would be that some of the text I've included in the letter is best placed in the schedule. Uh, so there's a letter that's being prepared to Second Sight in relation to the questions that they've asked. If we scroll up, please... There's a response from Mark Underwood. He says, hi, Belinda, as requested, please find attached a list of questions we are not providing answers to and the reasons why. Andy, there's one question I've highlighted. Did we actually ever send out the response with regards to the suspense accounts, uh, as I am unsure? In total, we're not providing answers to 41 of the 110 questions posed, 37%, split by reason in the table below, and he sets out there a table. So I think your evidence just before was that you did provide answers to lots of the questions. 
of those questions you weren't answering. 25% because you considered them to be phishing. Why even use phishing as an expression in relation to your independent investigators? Oh, this is Mark Underwood's assessment of those questions. I know that this, this actually went through a two-stage process. So I think this is version one of the answers. And then there was a discussion with Second Sight, I recall, where they clarified some of the questions. There was a discussion at the working group where the working group advised that some of the questions were too wide. And a version two was produced with a lot more answers. Would you accept that that's quite a high percentage of questions not being answered at that stage? At that stage, yes. If we scroll up, we can see your response. And you say, I've tried to flesh out some of the reasons so that it doesn't look like we're just stonewalling. I also think there are a few questions we may be able to answer or at least fudge an answer. I think it would be better to try and answer a question than just refuse entirely wherever possible. Um, so were you trying to push the post office to at least answer some more questions? If possible. From memory, some of the questions were, were very wide uh, to the point where they were, you know, it would require disproportionate effort. And what I was trying to encourage the post office to do was at least try to answer a question even if they couldn't provide a full answer. You, you asked to see the questions and the, the um, I think the table, and I can actually bring that onto screen, that is poll 0002-1864. Is this what you had in mind? Uh, no, I had in mind the actual final version of the answers that was sent at the end of January. Okay, well, this is the table that was attached to that email that I've just taken you to, mm -hmm. um, where you've used the, the word fudging an answer. And we can see 4.6D, for example, the question is, second site are asking, post office, um, any instance in the last three years in which post office initially determined that a cash loss was attributed to a sub-postmaster, but where it was subsequently found that the sub-postmaster was not responsible for the loss. And the reasons for not providing an answer is requesting general information on the occurrence of certain events without reference to it being raised by the applicants. And somebody has inserted their note. I think we could fudge the answer to this as follows, if we scroll down. As explained to Second Sight previously, sub-postmasters can challenge any cash loss or transaction correction in their branch in relation to ATMs. In many circumstances, the information needed to determine the cause of any discrepancy is only held by a sub-postmaster. There will therefore have been occasions when a transaction correction against a sub-postmaster has been challenged and reversed. This is, however, standard operating practice. Uh, can you assist us with who, who would have inserted that suggested form of words? If we scroll out again, we can see the reference. I mean, in your email, you referred to um, maybe able to answer or at least fudge an answer. Uh, and if we scroll up, sorry, we can see it says, note, I think we could fudge the answer to this as follows. D does that suggest that that proposed answer is from coming from you? It may have been, but I only provided this document a couple of days ago, so I haven't had a chance to consider it. Is it likely, given that you've used the word fudge in, in a covering email on the same date, uh, that that is, in fact, coming from you? I think that's possible, yes. Um, why, taking that as an example, why is it that that would have been something that couldn't be answered by the post office in response to a request from Second Sight? So my recollection is that post office was only given by the working group a very short period of time to respond. I think it might have been a month. I may have that wrong. And if you look at that question, it says, any instance in the last three years in which post office initially determined that a cash loss was attributed to a sub-postmaster, that is a very large period of time to cover across 10,000 branches. So my view is I don't think it would have been 
practical to be able to get to the bottom of that answer within the time available. And why wouldn't that have been the response? Why did you feel a need to fudge an answer to your independent investigators when the explanation could well have been, as you've just said, that is not reasonably practicable in the time? Well, I think, I think the answer that's given there is, is trying to assist them and to, to give them a, a steer as to why this information may not be relevant or needed. Um, but I'd, I'd have to see the final version of the document to decide where we actually ended up with this. It is fudging a steer, or is fudging fudging? No, I think we couldn't answer the question because there wasn't enough time. I think the answer given there, which I'm just reading again now, I think is, a, is an attempt to try and give a steer as to what's, what's, what post office's position was. Isn't it yet again taking a particularly adversarial approach to the independent investigators? Again, I, I, I don't know what time this document was. Sorry, I lost the date. I think you said it was 2014. My recollection is that after this, there was a meeting with Second Sight to discuss the questions that couldn't be answered, to try to reframe them, narrow them, recast them if needed, so that post office could then answer them. So yeah, I accept that to an extent this is adversarial, but it's also, as I say, it waxes and wanes, and then there's periods of cooperation as well. When, in your view, did it wane? Well, for example, sitting down with Second Sight and talking through these questions and trying to get to a mutual position on them. Could we please turn to poll 0015460? We're still in December 2014, the very end, 31st of December 2014. And there has been the Westminster Hall debate and the post office is formulating a response to uh, a case related to members of parliament's queries. Um, you're emailed by Melanie Caulfield, who, if we scroll down slightly, she's emailing you and Angela van der Bogard and others. She says, on the criminal cases, the main message to land now uh, that post office investigations are completed is our view uh, that there is nothing that undermines the safety of convictions, but legal routes have, of course, never been closed to people. This will be unpalatable in the extreme to some, and any meetings will certainly be made public, so we need to be in a position where we can release supporting non-case-specific documentation to counter inevitable allegations as much as po possible. So on the criminal cases, the main message to land now uh, that the, the post office investigations are completed is our view that there is nothing that undermines the safety of convictions. Uh, what investigations did you understand that to be referring to? I think that's a reference to the investigations through the mediation scheme. And having been somebody who was involved in the mediation scheme quite heavily during this period, um, is it your view that the, re the result of that mediation taking place um, was sufficient for the post office to form a view that there's nothing that undermines the safety of convictions? Every case in the scheme, the inve sorry, the investigation reports for every case in the scheme went to Cartwright King for review, uh, and I don't recall Cartwright King raising anything uh, in those reports that, that caused uh, uh, them to question the safety of a conviction. I'm going to move to the termination, proposed termination of Second Sight. Could we please look at poll 3022352? We're now in, this, um, in February 2015, 5th of February 2015. Uh, Patrick Bork emails you and he says, Dear Andy, we spoke briefly. I would be grateful if Bond Dickinson could produce a short bit of advice on the manner of implementation and consequences of a future decision to terminate Second Sight's engagement. Uh, the advice needs to cover, but should not be limited to, if other matters occur, uh, the nature and extent of the post office's ability to control access to and uses of all and any information it has provided Second Sight, the duration and effectiveness of that control in particular uh, with regard to the part two report that they are preparing 
and the legal and practical effects of the 30-day notice period uh, which the letter of engagement provides for. I'm also interested in the effects in legal and practical terms of a termination uh, given that the letter of engagement tries to make it clear that although they are engaged by us, they in fact work to the working group. You can imagine the sorts of arguments uh, which might be made. Now this is very shortly after the select committee appearance of Second Sight and Paula Venels. Um, it seems from this email, were you aware that it was the intention of the post office at, from this point to um, terminate the contract with Second Sight and not to have a part two report? I, either shortly before or shortly after this, I think I was provided with a, um, I can't remember if it was a board paper or a, or a steering group paper about the um, termination of Second Sight. So I was aware that that was the direction of travel that post office were heading in. And were you aware that one of the reasons why they wanted to terminate Second Sight at that point was before the part two report could be completed? Uh, the second version of the part two report, the first version had already been produced by this point. Um, I don't remember it about stopping the part two report. I remember the concern was more about ensuring that Second Sight focused on completing their investigations into individual cases before they focused on the part two report. Um, shall we look at the advice that you gave? That's poll 00006364. Thank you. It has Bond Dickinson on the final page, 6th of February 2015. Is this a, an advice that you wrote? Yes. Um, if we scroll down, please, there's a section on contract termination. So the contract between the post office and second site is governed by the engagement letter dated the 1st of July 2014 and a side letter. If we scroll over the page, please, to second site's position during the notice period. Here you're addressing um, the position of second site during that 30-day notice period. And you say as follows, under the um, engagement letter, Second Sight is required to continue providing the services until the end of the 30-day notice period and is entitled to be paid for any work done. Uh, there is, however, no converse obligation on the post office to keep asking Second Sight to do work during the notice period or at any time. Second Sight may try to argue that they have a right to continue to work during the 30-day notice period. We consider that this argument would be difficult for Second Sight to advance. First, the terms of uh, the letter simply do not provide for this. Secondly, or second, effectively, Second Sight would be arguing that there is a minimum guaranteed volume of work due to them, uh, due to them where no such guarantee was ever given. Third, Second Sight are paid on an hourly rate, so their pay is not conditional on the completion of work. One complicating factor is that the services include Second Sight assisting with any reasonable requests made by the working group and or post office. Although the working group has no legal standing to enforce the engagement letter, decisions of the working group can nevertheless influence Second Sight's work. If during the notice period the working group were to direct Second Sight to complete some work within the scope of the services, then Second Sight would be entitled to complete this work and expect payment. To avoid this situation, we would therefore recommend that in tandem with the termination of Second Sight, the working group is also disbanded so that it cannot give any directions to Second Sight. This will then enable post office to direct Second Sight to immediately cease all work. You've given in your witness statement a number of reasons why it was a sensible idea to terminate the working group. Um, but is looking at this now, is a significant consideration in the disbanding of the working group that the effect of that would be to stop Second Sight from carrying out any further work? This advice was from the legal perspective on that decision. And from a legal perspective, if post office wanted a clean exit, then it seemed to me that they needed to disband the working group as well. And had you had discussions 
with the post office that their intention was uh, to end second sight's work and to prevent them from being provided with any other instructions by the working group. No, that, that wasn't my understanding. My understanding is they wanted to bring to an end the current arrangement and replace it with a new arrangement that could see Second Sight complete their work. I can't now recall whether that explicitly included part two or not. Let's look at the disbanding of the working group. Can we please turn to poll 00021908? There was a draft paper that was circulated for um, Sparrow Subcommittee. We see that if we scroll over the page, on page two, mm -hmm. Mark Davis is sending a first draft of that paper. Um, we then have, on page one, your views. I'll just take you to a few passages from this email. Um, Belinda, a few thoughts below on the Sparrow paper. In general, I agree with the idea of disbanding the working group as, one, it offers no real value, and two, uh, it is the source of much of criticism of the post office. However, I see some challenges with the other two limbs of the proposal, and you then go on to address those two limbs. Uh, first is Second Sight's role. And you say, if Second Sight are independently contracted by applicants, then I cannot see how the post office can dictate Second Sight's scope of work. So one of the proposals was to let applicants themselves appoint Second Sight. Is that correct? Yes. And your view was that that was not sensible because the post office would lose control? Uh, yes, in particular in terms of timing, because the great difficulty to this point was that Second Sight were a long way behind schedule. If we scroll down, we can see a second suggestion, mediating all non-criminal cases. And you say as follows, mediating all non-criminal cases, of course, means mediating lots of hopeless cases. Mediating unmeritorious cases raises applicants' expectations unfairly and may, in fact, create greater animosity and complaints. Certainly, that was my experience from MRO2. My recommendation would be for the post office to take a tougher line and only mediate meritorious cases, even if the bar for this is set low. Just pausing there, wasn't that the very purpose of the working group itself, to, to vet those applications, to work out which were meritorious so that they could go forward? Uh, that's, what, that's what I expected at the outset. However, th through a series of decisions of the working group during the course of 2014, uh, Sir Anthony Hooper decided to take a, a, an approach which lowered the bar on whether cases should go to mediation or not. And did you disagree then with Sir Anthony Hooper's approach? I did disagree with that decision, yes. Um, aren't you here, though, suggesting imposing a bar, albeit a low bar? Uh, the distinction here is that um, the working group were prepared to put cases through to mediation where the sub-postmaster had been convicted. That created a problem for post office because it had been advised by its criminal lawyers not to mediate with anyone with a conviction. And that tension, in my view, was probably the root cause of the working group breaking down at the end of 2014. Um, we saw earlier that email where, I know you said it was just a snapshot, but a very high number of cases that had been deemed unsuitable by the post office. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you get from a position where you are determining that a large number are unsuitable to saying, actually, we'll mediate all non-criminal cases. So again, I think you have to be careful with that list because I, I feel it may not be, a, I think it may be a subset of sub-postmasters. I recognise some of the numbers on those lists and I think a number of them were sub-postmasters with convictions. Though I can't remember all the names and the numbers now. So I, 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 don't, I wouldn't draw anything from that list. Um, I think this is, this is a proposal here to say, um, post office should, should be looking to mediate meritorious cases even if the bar is low. Reflecting now on, on all of those emails and just your recollection of, of that mediation process, do you think that the process itself w was doomed to fail? No, I don't believe so. I think people went into it in good faith. I think uh, the breakdown of, I think the relationship with Second Sight could have been better between post office and second site, I think that could have been more collaborative. Um, I think that would have required more compromise on both sides to reach that to reach that stage. 
but I still think that the mediation scheme did a lot of good. Do you think, reflecting on it, you personally should have taken a less adversarial approach? Uh, towards second sight, yes. With hindsight, I wish that... I think there were some points where we were fair in criticising second sight, but there were some where uh, we were too adversarial. I'm going to move on now to the topic of remote access. Um, I will, I'll go through a few documents and then we'll take our mid-afternoon break. Um, but then I'll stick with remote access probably for the rest of the day. It's possible that I might move on to one other topic before we finish for the day. Um, could we start, please, with poll 00031456? So we're starting 1st of February 2015, and there are discussions with Melanie Caulfield and Mark Underwood. If we scroll down slightly, actually, if we could, let's start on page three. Melanie Caulfield emails Roderick Williams. What would be the circumstances for post office adding a transaction? Uh, we did so once since 2010 using functionality. I know very rare, strict authority, uh, but will we need to ever do this? If we scroll up to page two, there's an email from yourself. If we scroll up slightly more. Uh, and you respond to say, Mel, sorry, we've never got any clarity of this point. The reality is that the use of the manual balancing process is so rare that there is no protocol for its use. If we scroll up, we see more correspondence on the issue. Page one, the middle of page one, and it, you're still involved in this email chain. Mark Underwood to Melanie Caulfield and yourself. Um, Mark Underwood says, it comes back to Andy's point about the question being wrong. Access can mean view. Uh, the question is, can transactions be edited remotely? To which the answer is no. Once a transaction is in, it cannot be removed or edited in any way. All that can happen is for additional transactions to be put in to correct mistakes, all of which are visible to the sub postmaster. Now, we know now that that is wrong. Um, if PV and MD, that's Paula Venels and Mark Davis, are still confused, I would just send them the below extract from the paper, as I think it makes it quite clear what can and cannot be done. Alternatively, we treat any questions about remote access with the contempt they deserve. Why on earth would post office have a secret bunker in Bracknell accessing sub-postmaster accounts. Um, and then it sets out there the issue and the response. If we scroll up, we see a response from Melanie Caulfield. And uh, she says, at one time, our line was simply, there is no remote access. But for most people, I think that sounded unlikely, given that you have to have full support, etc. It has a different meaning for different people. I completely agree re-showing contempt about the allegations on this subject. It's a prime example, actually, of our rigor in investigating allegations that are in the realms of fantasy. And what was your view on receiving those emails? It appears to me that Mark Underwood has set out factually what we understood the position to be at that time. Admittedly, that was wrong. Um, the language around um, I think treat with contempt uh, I think is probably too strong. Did you think that at the time or were those the kinds of emails that you would receive on the topic of remote access? I think at the time people thought it was a very unlikely possibility that remote access was the actual cause of losses in branches. And at this time, going through the mediation scheme, determining the cause of a loss in the branch is the central, central question. Um, so people generally thought, including myself, um, that remote access was never going to really move forward these cases. 
through the scheme. Could we please turn to poll 0312743? bottom of page one over into page two. March 2015. Um, all, we've been through the prosecution file for MO56 Wiley. There will be further documents to disclose, including the attached witness statement by Gareth Jenkins. At the top of page three, Jenkins states, I also note a comment made about it being possible to remotely access the system. It is true that such access is possible. However, in an analysis of data audited by the system, it is possible to identify any data uh, that has not been input directly by staff in the branch. Any such change to data is very rare and would be authorized by Post Office Limited. As I have uh, not had an opportunity to examine data related to this branch, I cannot categorically say that this has not happened in this case, but would suggest it is highly unlikely. Um, and, and you say as follows, you say, I'm pretty certain that Jenkins is referring to balancing transaction process that allows Fujitsu to input new transactions rather than edit old transactions. Nevertheless, this will be a red rag to <coughs> second sight. Why would it be a red rag to second sight? Uh, because they were concerned about anything around re remote access. And the suggestion here being not just uh, that old transactions can be edited, but that new transactions can be input. Correct. Uh, thereby adding some substance to the allegation of remote access, uh, potentially. It would, it would add, it add substance to the... Um, question of whether it was possible or not, I don't think that would change the question of whether remote access was actually a probative cause of losses in branches. If we scroll up, please. Roderick Williams to yourself, he says, uh, this is consistent with our responses slash statements about remote access, isn't it? I.e., you can add data, inject a balancing transaction, and if done, it is possible to identify any data that has not been input directly by staff in the branch. And your response is at the top, uh, not quite. We say that transactions entered by subpostmasters cannot be edited, but we don't go on to say that Fujitsu can input new transactions in exceptional circumstances. This information would therefore be entirely new news to Second Sight. Were you by this stage uh, quite concerned about the information that had so far been disclosed about remote access? Yes. So when I first found out about the ability to inject balancing transactions, was back in 2014. Uh, I'd advise post office that they should give that information to, to Second Sight, and it's a point of regret for me that I didn't press them to do that much sooner than now. And in response to this issue being raised in March 2015, are you aware of that information then being disclosed to Second Sight? I think it was provided to them the next month. Could we please look at WBON 301024? If we could start, please, on page three, the bottom of page three into page four. We're now in 2016, July 2016. Uh, you are emailing counsel Anthony Degar Robinson. And you say on, on, over that page, your comments on the letter of response. So at this stage, you're on the letter of response to the group litigation. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. Um, are understood and very helpful. We'll work the general structure of the letter and then come back to you to discuss specific points. Uh, off the back of yesterday's call, I think I now have a better grasp of the central tenets of our case. I've tried to capture these below just to see if it matches your thinking. And then it's at two that you address... Um, remote access. So the branch accounting system, including the role of Horizon within the accounting system, is built around the principle that postmasters approve every transaction that goes into their accounts. A, they or their assistants enter all transactions conducted in branch, and B, they or their assistants 
approve any transactions originating from the post office, such as transaction corrections. And in brackets, it says as follows, note, the issue of remote access is critical here. My understanding is that the post office will not use a balancing transaction without postmaster consent, in which case this complies with the above principle, but we need Deloitte to, to confirm this. And it says absolutely. I, are you able to assist in whose words those are? are those, is that your email or is that somebody inputting into your email? I can't tell. Certainly by this stage, the summer of 2016, you recognised the critical nature of that remote access point? Yes. Uh, poll 3029990. have an email from yourself to Jane McLeod, Roderick Williams and others, um, further to some Deloitte investigations. Um, before tomorrow's steering group meeting, I wanted to give you a heads up on remote access issues. Deloitte has identified that a small number of super users at Fujitsu have the ability to delete and edit transactions from the branch database. Uh, the branch database is the central server on which all branch transactions are recorded before being passed to other servers. The access is subject to strict controls and Deloitte's current understanding is that it would not be possible to delete or edit transactions without leaving a footprint in the audit trail. They also believe that one, this type of access is not unusual and two, the likelihood of someone actually making such changes is extremely low. Uh, the super user access is a separate yet more extensive process to the balancing transaction process we previously knew about. Then you go on to identify what the issue is. The immediate concern is that this means the post office's historic statements about not being able to edit or delete transactions appear, at least on face value, to have been materially incorrect. This therefore may bring into play, one, allegations of deceit, in the post office has made false statements. Two, a basis for unwinding the settled cases. Three, the possibility for some claimants to extend their limitation deadline. If we scroll down, you say, once we have a much clearer picture, we may wish to seek Brian Altman's advice on whether this issue causes any concerns for criminal law slash disclosure perspective. We may also need to give consideration to whether to inform the Criminal Cases Review Commission. Um, so first of all, this is presumably quite a significant moment for you, having been involved in the issue of transaction corrections for quite a number of years now. Uh, the issue of balancing transactions. Uh, the issue of super users. So, yes. Yes, uh, well, we were, by this point, we'd seen, I'd been provided with copies of Deloitte's earlier reports uh, and the Swift review, which pulled this issue out. So this is further investigations by Deloitte. Um, you've identified there under issues, slightly further up, some civil issues, mm -hmm. uh, but then you refer also to seeking Brian Altman's advice and the Criminal Cases Review Commission potentially mm -hmm. uh, having to inform them. Is this again an example where, although you are not, as you've said many times, the criminal law expert, you are touching upon matters that affect the criminal law potential appeals? Uh, here, yes, because I also recall that a year earlier we had already got Brian's advice on the remote access issues. Thank you. Um, so I will be continuing with more questions on remote access, but perhaps that is an appropriate time to take our mid-afternoon break. Yes, by all means. Um, if we could yep. come back at 30, uh, 25 minutes to four. Certainly. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can we please turn to poll 00245978, please? The bottom of the first page into the second page, please. We're now on the 27th of November 2016, and you have drafted a letter to Freeths in response to their last substantive letter. And you say as follows, the majority of this letter addresses legal and procedural points. The key substantive area is section nine on remote access. 
Following feedback from Deloitte, we cannot definitively say that the post office, as distinct from Fujitsu, never had the ability to change horizon data because Deloitte and the current staff at Fujitsu just don't have enough knowledge of old horizon to confirm this. This was a point made in an early draft, but it has now been removed. We have, I hope, now found a formulation of words that avoids having to overly throw Fujitsu to the wolves and avoids any risk of waiving privilege in any documents, but still gives us a fair story to tell. What did you mean there by throwing Fujitsu to the wolves? Uh, this, I think this letter is addressing not just remote access, but the statements that post office had made historically about remote access. And the view was that a lot of the previous incorrect statements about remote access were because Fujitsu had given us incorrect information or had given incorrect information to post office. Now, was that your view? Was that the view of the post office or was it both? Uh, both. Um, you say, we have also toned down the admissions of making incorrect statements, though they're still there. I hope this might make it easier to get this letter cleared through the group executive and Fujitsu. So it seems as though Fujitsu are clearing the form of words that goes to um, Freeths. Is that correct? Uh, where we were writing letters on technical issues, then that type of language would go past Fujitsu to get their confirmation they thought it was accurate. If we scroll up, please, we have a response from Rob Houghton. He says, I personally think we overdo the response on access, and I've suggested some changes. If we scroll up again, there's a response from Thomas Moran, also of post office. He says, my overall conclusion is that could very well have serious implications on the proceedings, um, and we absolutely have to make sure we are briefing and securing the support of the right people internally before issuing. As I'm the lucky man with responsibility for this, um, as the steering group chair, I must ask that we get this properly reviewed by Mark Davis and also Angela, who I don't think are on the list. In particular, we need a full assessment and media plan based on the worst case consequences in place before sending. Can you assist us with the position um, within the post office, the concern at that time regarding the letter that was going to be sent to Freeths? Uh, if it's the letter I'm thinking of, it was making concessions that post office had previously made incorrect statements about remote access, and that was the concern. And there's reference here to Mark Davis. Mm -hmm. Was he somebody you knew? I knew of him. He was the communications director. How involved was he in these kinds of issues, from what you saw? Uh, he, he would occasionally get involved in uh, some of the legal issues that were coming up in the scheme. Is it a fair reading of this correspondence that there was real concern within the business at this stage about this admission? Yes, there was real concern about making this, this admission. Could we please turn to poll 00415440? This is actually the day before that final email in the chain, but it all relates to the same issue, the same letter. It says, uh, it's from yourself uh, to council, and you say, Rod has gone through the remote access section. The content is broadly the same. He has reordered the structure, which I like a lot, and toned down the mayor culpa, but I think this still works. W was that something that the post office was doing, toning down the mayor culpa? I th my recollection at this time is this letter does clearly state that post office made incorrect statements about remote access. There was some debate about the language that was used then to describe that situation, but I don't recall that there be, was any real debate about the direction the letter needed to go in. If we look at poll 00246005 at the bottom of that page, The 
the bottom of the page, please. You, this is the 28th of November. Please find attached the updated remote access wording. The general direction of your comments was to be less apologetic in tone and less repetitive, both of which we've tried to accommodate in the attached. The key issue is how far we want to go in accepting that incorrect statements have been made in the past. I believe that some of the drafting slash tone changes are coming out uh, of us not having a settled view on this issue, and you suggest a call. Um, so you say that the general direction of your comments was to be less apologetic. Where in particular uh, was that coming from in your view? I, I can't now recall. <laughs> Uh, we'd, have, we'd have sought comments on that drafting from probably the people who, on this email chain. Moving into 2017 now, could we turn to poll 00249553? And we're now on to the drafting of the defence. So the admission has been made to Freeths in November 2016. We're now on to the defence in the summer of 2017. Um, you are sending round the draft defence from council. If we scroll down paragraph two, it says, paragraph 52, do we say that Paul previously relied on incorrect statements from Fujitsu in relation to remote access? This is basically dropping Fujitsu in it. Um, same point, I think, as, as before, really. Um, it seems as though your view at that point was that Fujitsu were at fault or were to blame in some way, or that it was suggestive of that in the draft defence? Uh, I felt that Fujitsu were primarily responsible, um, not solely responsible, but primarily responsible. And there was a, I, can, I, I recall there was some debate around exactly how we put that point in the draft defence. Could we turn to WBON 40496, please? From Anthony de Gaulle Robinson, um, you're copied in here, 10th of July 2017. Another version of the draft defence is circulated. If we have a look at paragraph 60, um, he says, the more I think about it, the more I think the whole of paragraph 60, other than the first two sentences, ought to be deleted. Um, and there's reference to mediation, etc., in there that he doesn't want included. And it's the final line, final sentence there. It says, this seems to give us no excuse for not having researched the problem properly before we said remote alteration was not possible. Where do you consider the blame lies uh, for insufficient research? It seems as though his view there was us being the post office rather than Fujitsu. Where, where do you think the blame lies for not having researched the problem properly? I, I don't, I'm not sure whether Tony's using the word us to mean post office or Fujitsu or the collective side of the case that was the post office side of the case. Um, sorry, can you repeat your question? What is your view, though? What? I mean, we're, we're here, we're years later now, you know, we're in 2017, we're still debating on how how it's going to be phrased, the remote access issue. It's clearly an important issue to the business. Um, you've placed a lot of blame with Fujitsu, but is it your view that the blame only lies with Fujitsu or, or that there was a failure at the post office end to research the problem properly? My view is it primarily sat with Fujitsu. I think... Uh, there may have, there's probably some underlying problem with post office not understanding the horizon system in enough detail across its organization uh, and I also uh, to, to some degree accept some accountability on my part because I feel I should have pushed harder on this issue during the scheme. Could we please turn to poll 00249919? We're still in July. 2017, um, and you send an email to council, a quick note uh, so that you're in the loop on my meetings with the post office over the last few days. 
Uh, both the Postmaster Litigation Steering Group and the Group Executive are comfortable with the defence by this stage. And you say, I've briefed both the Postmaster Litigation Steering Group and the Group Executive on what I saw as the key risk areas as follows. And then two is Horizon Integrity Remote Access. Um, much more comfortable now we have Deloitte's work. Deloitte's view is that it is unlikely that data integrity slash remote access is the true cause of the problems. Uh, the post office has previously made false statements, and we admit this. Uh, deny that we uh, that were known to be false when made. And, and you say this, both the steering group and the group executive are very uncomfortable about this, but understand the tactical reasons for this approach. Can you assist us with what you meant there? I, I recall that senior management at post office were uncomfortable with making an admission that the uh, previous statements had been incorrect. Um, who do you have in mind there? I don't, I can't place it to an individual because I would have been at that time, I think, getting a lot of the feedback indirectly via the legal team, and I can't now recall these calls I, or meetings I had with the GE at that time. But the message that was coming to you from the legal team was that the steering group and group executive were very uncomfortable about that. Yes, and, and, and actually I, I can recall speaking to the steering group about it and getting that sense directly from them as well. And much discussion about media comments and managing bad publicity. Do we understand, looking at all these documents that we've been looking at this afternoon in relation to remote access, that you were personally very involved in the remote access issue from the legal side? Uh, if, if you're talking about the, which period of time are you talking about? Um, the documents we've been looking at, so 20, let's say 2016, 2017 period. Yes. Um, there was a lot of focus on the wording a lot of care was taken over how that was presented. Do you agree with that? Correct. It was a significant issue for the business as a whole, post office, uh, the, the admission. I, I couldn't comment as to what they thought about it as a wider business issue. I can tell you they thought it was important within the context of the litigation. And as we've seen, a lot of toing and froing and care taken over the issue of remote access in terms of how it would affect the litigation? Uh, yes. Um, could we please turn to poll 00254632, please? Now, this is a chain of emails. I appreciate that it's a document that you will only have seen this morning, but I'd like your assistance on it. Let's start on page four, if we may. If we scroll down, please. Actually, if we, if we go to page six, just to have a look at how this issue comes in, there's somebody from Information Services called Eleanor Bradley on page six, if we scroll up please. Thank you. Um, it is discussion about an issue that has been raised in a particular post office. Mm -hmm. If we can please turn to page four and the email from Jonathan Gribben to yourself. So Jonathan Gribben was a managing associate in your firm. Is that correct? Correct. And I'd like to just read <coughs> this email. He says, Andy, I've spoken to Sri. Now, was Sri the postmaster, do you recall? I don't know. I think it's the person who has at least raised the issue. And he has sent me the email chain below by way of further background. Ah, so in fact, Sri is um, at the, uh, from the post office. He is the lead branch availability manager. Um, so he has raised it with your firm. In summary, post office have exhausted all other ways of cancelling this transaction correction. And I agree that there is no alternative but for Fujitsu to manually remove it. Some key points. 
The transaction correction relates to a redundant product that this branch never sold. Post office reinstated the product and gave the branch permission to sell it, but it was not possible for the branch to accept the transaction correction. Post office cannot issue another transaction correction to net the first one off for the same reason. The transaction correction was issued due to human error rather than technical fault. So just pausing there, there, a transaction correction has been issued in relation to this branch. The branch is a McColls branch, so it's less likely that the claimants in the group litigation will become aware of the issue and get the wrong end of the stick. And in Sri's view, the real risk to post office is not fixing the issue, as it's preventing the branch from completing its trading period. The branch may have been incurring losses, and in the circumstances, post office is likely to have to pick those losses up. Are you happy for me to give Sri the green light to have Fujitsu remove the transaction correction? So there has been an issue in a branch, it's a McColls branch, I think a chain branch, and it seems as though they are holding off asking Fujitsu to remove the transaction correction because of the ongoing litigation and the issue of remote access. Is that right? Uh, yes, that appears what that's saying. And if we scroll up, we have your response. And you say, can they not settle the transaction correction centrally and then wipe it off the postmaster's account? Were you, at this point, qualified to be making suggestions as to how to correct an error in a branch's account? Uh, I knew. Uh, enough about transaction corrections that there were a couple of ways they could be processed through the system. Um, where it refers to a postmaster's account there, that doesn't mean the account on Horizon. That means the account at FSC. And why are you getting involved in the minutiae of a postmaster's account? Because it appears from the email below, and I have to say I, I don't recall this email, and as you said earlier, I only was past it this morning, it appears from the email below that the solution being proposed is for Fujitsu to manually delete or remove some data. That's a uh, version of remote access, it appears, and that's a very uh, key issue in the litigation. Um, if we scroll up, we see Angela van der Bogard. She says, no, I asked Sri last night when he rang me. The issue is that the branch cannot process the transaction correction at all. If we scroll up, we have your response. And you say this, oh, I think we, the legal team, need to take charge of this process. Whatever documents are produced are likely to be disclosable. And I would like, as far as possible, for this to be covered by privilege or have controlled their content. One, as a first step, I would like Sri to copy all emails on this topic, past and future, to Johnny. Johnny, so Johnny's a lawyer, is he? Correct. Johnny, please then keep this somewhere separate and safe. He should then be instructed to take no further action for now. Second, I would like to escalate this to Pete and Torsten at Fujitsu so that they can produce for us a full and privileged note on what has happened and why there is no alternative but to editing the data. Third, we can then make a decision on how to proceed in light of the full facts. I understand that this is going to cause operational problems and risks in this branch, but if not handled pro properly, this could be disastrous for the group litigation. Doesn't this take us back to where we began today, at the very beginning, that your advice to the post office is let's blanket this in privilege. This is a technical issue with a branch, not a claimant's branch, just a random branch that is affected that needs a correction. And your advice is let's cover this in privilege because it could risk, could be disastrous for the group litigation. Just as in the very early years you were advising uh, in, in respect of, for example, the notification to the insurer. Let's not write that down. 
let's deal with it, cover it in privilege as far as we can. I think in the context here, and as I've said a number of times, I think the, all of these decisions are context specific. We're in the middle of a large piece of litigation. An issue has arisen that is uh, related to one of the key issues in that litigation. I think it's appropriate uh, for any organisation to avail itself of uh, legal privilege to investigate that issue. To be clear, that's not to say that the issue wouldn't be brought to light. I think it's possible for an organisation to investigate something under privilege and then to make decisions later when it has the full facts as to how that then gets disclosed through the, through the litigation process. But here we have hold off making that correction to a branch, unrelated branch, because of the impact on the group litigation. Do you think that was an appropriate approach to take? I do think that was an appropriate approach to take. Um, does it make any difference for you that the post office uh, is owned by the government, by the taxpayer, in how that kind of litigation is conducted? I still think post office was entitled to avail itself of legal, prison, legal privilege. Um, final document I'll take you to today, it's poll 00276195. an email from yourself to Ben Fote and Roderick Williams in June 2019, and you're explaining to Ben Fote about some of the history of the litigation and why an overall advice had not been obtained. I'll read the email. It says, the concern at the outset was that any early settlement would be seen as conceding the claimant's arguments on the sub-postmaster contracts and horizon. This would then possibly open up the floodgates to more claims. So the plan was for the post office to try to secure some positive decisions in its favor before breaching the topic of settlement. The strategy was to contest the common issues trial because based on the advice from counsel, post office should win on most points. When the common issues expected to be resolved in post office's favor, either the claimant's funding would collapse or they might walk away for a modest settlement that when viewed against a positive common issues judgment uh, would not set a dangerous precedent. With this in mind, before the common issues judgment was handed down, we had already agreed a mediator with Freeths and had begun planning for settlement discussions. Further, post office had Deloitte review the Horizon system out at the outset of the litigation, and they advised that Horizon was robust and extremely unlikely to be the cause of shortfalls in branches. This therefore gave us a backup plan in case the resolution didn't come immediately in the wake of the common issues judgment. Deloitte gave us a degree of confidence in winning the Horizon trial, and that might then cause the claimant's funding to collapse, or a modest settlement would be positive possible, sorry. If this didn't work, then the next steps were, was to thin the herd. By this, we meant identifying subgroups of claimants whose claims could be defeated on a technicality or legal point. For example, trying to strike out all of the time barred claims. By thinning the herd, you undermine the economics of the group. Less claimants means less damages, which makes the funder's return on investment lower to the point where they would prefer to settle rather than invest more money. And it's this final paragraph, substantive paragraph, that I'd like to focus on. You say, the strategy was never to seek an outright win through the court process, for that would mean ultimately defending 500 plus individual claims in 500 plus separate trials, because the cases turn on their own facts and the utility of dealing with them as a group gradually erodes as more group issues are resolved and you are left with individual issues. Even if post office's legal case was perfect, securing a full resolution through the courts would take years and be massively disproportionately expensive. Hence the above plan to build leverage and air cover through the court process to force a settlement or collapse of the litigation. Does that explain the approach that you took to disclosure throughout these years? 
that you would never see a final trial. So no one would ultimately look under the various rocks that have been placed over these pieces of information. No, I don't re ever recall thinking like that. Was it a strategy to delay disclosure of important documents, just like uh, we saw in relation to that Amy Prime email that you inputted into? Uh, delay, delay, delay disclosure until the moment at which you're becoming criticised and then you can provide it. And if that strategy worked, you would never have to provide certain information because the plan was never to hear the full trial until the end. No, I think you've referred to one outlier email. And if you look at the balance of the advice we gave on disclosure to post office, it was actually to err on the side of giving more disclosure and being generous with disclosure. So that might be an appropriate moment to break for the day. Yeah. I have at most one hour uh, left, and then we have questioning from core participants, which shouldn't be more than around an hour and a half at most two hours. So we'll, we'll, we have plenty of time tomorrow. But, but then that's fine. Um, and I'd be grateful, uh, Mr. Blake, if you just send me a rough breakdown of what we expect with the core participants so that I'm au fait of what's likely to occur, if you would. Absolutely. But, but, but yes, let's call it a day for today. And we'll resume again at um, 9.45 tomorrow. Thank you very much, sir.